Welcome back to the Thermo Diet Podcast with Jayton Miller. How's it going? I'm here with my co-host, Tyler Woodward. How you doing today, Jaden? I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. This is the 100th episode of the Thermo Diet Podcast today. Let's go. Let's go. Congratulations. 100 episodes, 100 good ones. Yep. It's been a long time coming, but we're finally here. Yep. Hopefully we can make this one a banger. Yes, definitely. So what are we talking about today? Well, today's episode is brought to you by Zubru. Uh, we are powered by Zubru today. It's brought to you for the 100th episode because we are ready to go. So I've been really liking Zubru this week. Been drinking a lot. It honestly does last all day. And honestly, I think it lives up to its expectations. And today we're going to be talking about the bioenergetic theory of health and all of its relationship to what we do and theories regarding it. Awesome. Sweet. Let's so uh, what does bioenergetics mean to you? Um, basically the flow of energy through a system, mm-hmm. um, especially uh, specifically a system that is living, hence bio. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's really the main concept of bioenergetics is right, is that ener- you need energy to create order. We see this over and over again on every living being from cells to human nature, right? You have a lot of money as a civilization. You can build walls real quick. You can build cars. You can, you know, that's what's happened the last couple hundred years. We became really good at farming. We had really reliable food sources. And now we were able to invest in in ourselves, learning how to become specialists in certain things. We became better and better and better. And we evolved much faster. Yeah. The way that Ray typically puts it is that um, energy and structure are interdependent at every level. Mm -hmm. Um, And the more energy that you have to create structure or order, um, the more complex functions that can take place within that system. Yeah. So I think you see that at the cellular. I think that is a huge part of what drove our evolution and drove evolution of everything. Um, like you see this at the cellular level, like eventually oral bacteria starts going from anaerobic metabolism using without oxygen starts using anaerobic metabolism. And then you start seeing these colonies form and them starting to specialize in certain things. And the more energy, the better they become at producing energy, the faster they evolve and the more speciation we see, which eventually gave way to modern life as we know it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, specifically like, um, our advancement to from like homo sapiens to what we currently are today. Um, a lot of people have a different names for what we currently are in our modern area, but um, the ability to cook played a huge role in mm-hmm. that and the ability to actually be able to digest a lot of the foods that we were eating at the time um, more effectively led to a lot of the um, energy availability within that food. hundred percent. I mean, I think a huge driving factor in our evolution as humans is are, we're the, the only real omnivores, right, where we eat a lot of meat, a lot of fruit, maybe some veggies and roots, and we get a lot of those fat-soluble vitamins. And then we're also not spending all day digesting. You see this on both sides. You see the, the omnivores or the herbivores like cows, ruminants. They're eating all day long and sleeping on the job pretty much. Mm-hmm. And then you see carnivores. They'll eat every once in a while, and once they get food, they're sleeping all day. Um, we are very good at digesting things. We can. We are the first people that can cook. So we didn't have to break down the meat as much as possible or as, as much as the carnivores do. Mm-hmm. Um, we can have a more constant supply of food because we were able to store meat, store fruit, store all this stuff. And I think that is what gave way. And also we had fat soluble vitamins from eating animals. We had glucose from eating um, fruits mm-hmm. and roots. And then we had the amino acids, the fat soluble vitamins, the water soluble vitamins. We were in this sphere where our... Cells have to work the least hard to produce the most energy because we give it all to them. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. And, you know, you see that throughout evolution, but you also see that in your modern life. Like people nowadays, whenever you are able to stay in a healthy state or get to a healthy state, um, you have an abundance of energy that you're able to pull from in order to be able to serve others as well. Um, whether that is through creative thinking and through the advancement of technology and society, or if it's simply just serving others through your time, your money, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that based on the more energy you have on a biological level also just resonates up with everything. Like you're able to learn more. You're less, more rational, I would say, and like able to weave through better decisions and not be as emotionally attached to things. Mm-hmm. Um, 
not always like glued to an idea like you're willing to accept be more open to things yeah definitely um yeah you you definitely don't attach your identity to a lot of the ideas that you have um and whenever you're able to um i feel like whenever you get to that state you're able to more readily accept that your idea might not be the best idea um and you're able to allow the most um well thought through and like good idea to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think you see it all the time today with people are just saying like, it's my way or the highway or like they just laugh at other people because they don't think the right thing. I think we got to all understand that like we're on this journey and someone might be on step A when you're on step Z or, you know, somewhere in between like, and the person from that's at step A doesn't need to go to step Z. They need to go step B, right? Like just understand that we're at different points and that, we'll all get there eventually. Yeah, definitely. I also think that energy availability has a lot to do with your ability to adapt to like, you see this a lot with older people, like they're stuck in their ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you see younger, younger people who are able to adapt rapidly to something, especially kids. Like they adapt so freaking fast. Um, which is nice. Um, the adaptability is really good to have, especially whenever you're, we're living in a world that is constantly changing and you constantly have to adapt to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I mean, you just see a steep decline in our ability to like neuroplasticity, just our ability to adapt to stress over time. And I think that's because basically, I mean, I don't like using the machine analogy, but like we get worn down over time, but the more energy that you can have flow through you at a constant rate, the more you're going to be able to fend off disorder, right? So the more you're going to be able to continually adapt to things, continually see new stimuli, get stronger, smarter, learn new activities, things like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. What else does bioenergetics mean to you? <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's just so fundamental to how we think about things. Like when you think about the c contrast to bioenergetic theory, right? It's like the rate of living theory. Mm -hmm. And it's basically like you're born, it's looking at the body like a machine, like you're born with a certain number of heartbeats. You're born with this genes that are going to dictate whether or not you get cancer or all of these things and when you look at it from the bioenergetic theory it's like it kind of flips all of that on its head because it's all about maximizing um what your energy flow and mm -hmm. that might look different from someone else for, and that might look different from you um, a couple months from now a couple years from now down the line yeah um i would say like one of the things that it probably means for me is that um have you, you haven't read the Kabbalion yet, have you? Not yet. Um, they talk about basically like different planes of existence and like how on each different plane of existence, there's different vibrational frequencies that mm. you exist on. Um, and so, you know, they're proving this with like in quantum physics and stuff like that with things like quarks and vortexes and stuff like that at the quantum level. Mm. Um, basically... We, the reality that we live in and the things that manifest us are all a form of energy. And so whenever you think about bioenergetics, it is intimately tied to everything that we experience at all. Yeah. Period. I, we were talking about this a little bit before, um, how like psilocybin, LSD, they are anti-serotonin antagonist mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, and serotonin by many is believed to be the, how do you describe it, the lens? Um, so basically the way that Aldous Huxley puts it is that the serotonin receptors in the brain act as like a filter for the amount of stimulus that we're able to let in into the system. Because um, if we didn't have a filter for the stimulus that is coming in with the reality around us, our biological systems wouldn't be able to keep up with the amount of stimulus that is being placed on them. And so ser the serotonin kind of acts like a governor for that. Um, so it only lets a certain amount of reality in that our biological systems are able to handle. Um, and the more energy production that you have, the more expansive your consciousness is, so to speak, because you're able to down-regulate the amount of serotonin receptors that you have and allow for more stimulus to come in. Um, and then on the opposite side of that, the more serotonin that you have um, and the more serotonin receptors that you have, the more 
I mean, this is one of the reasons that serotonin is like the hibernation molecule, mm-hmm. um, because it's slowly shutting down the system or putting it into like a hibern- hibernation state um, to where reality kind of goes away and your metabolic rate goes down. So you can spend, uh, I don't know, seven, eight months in a hibernation state, mm-hmm. uh, a very low energetic, um, low interaction, low reality type of state. Yeah. And it's like interesting that the uh, Hans Motto is a great article. I think Ray's talked about this as well, like the high serotonin personality mm-hmm. where it's just like they kind of don't question a lot of things. Um, it's like this state of learned helplessness that you see in rat studies. So basically if you give rats an injection of serotonin or endotoxin too, I think a lot of times when you put them in the pond, they were a little water bowl of water. They'll swim for like five, 10 minutes. I don't know the exact numbers and they just stop. They let themselves drown comparatively to the normal rats, the control group, who will just swim for hours and hours and hours, basically trying to survive the other rats just lose the the willingness to live pretty much. Mm-hmm. They think they're trapped. They think they're fucked. And you see this with uh, dogs too. Um, you see this with a lot of animals. Um, when they're trapped, they believe if you... So uh, an interesting study that Ray's quoted, um, if I am torturing you, like shocking you, whatever, um, if the difference between if I can have something in my mouth where I can, um, what's it called? Like chew, hold on to it, like you know what I'm talking about. Like, mm-mm. so like they, uh, if you you went through surgery back in the day, they put like a piece of wood in your mouth so you could bite down onto it, mm-hmm. and it would help to it, a it would give you some control, but it just also helps to decrease the pain because I think you can bite down on something. Okay, having the control of being able to bite down on something literally decreased like that le- feeling of learned helplessness because they ha- felt that they were in somewhat control. Mm-hmm. But if you just took that away, just that simple thing, they felt like they were. Uh, they had no hope they they lost it so they were completely out of control there's nothing they could do they were just in this pain no matter what and the difference in in outcomes was immense that the guys that had the wood in their mouth or the dogs whatever they weren't depressed they didn't they they had hope the entire time versus the other people just completely lost it Mm -hmm. it's interesting and i think a lot of it is about this like abundance a mindset versus uh, what's the opposite of abundance? Um, usually they call it the victim mentality okay. um, or the scarcity mindset. Scarcity mindset. I like that. But where basically just you realize that there's more than enough to go around. Mm-hmm. You're not looking for scarcity. You're not, you don't realize that this is my way of the highway, that I need, I need to capitalize on this. No one else can have peace. I think you've talked about this a lot. I think that's a very important mindset and bioenergetics. And it's something that you like the more deeper you get, the more you see. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I just feel like why would you want to get like what's the purpose of having good health if you're not able to share it with people? Um, Like I feel like once you get to a certain state of health, you want other people to experience it with you. You don't want to just sit there by yourself and look around and be like, man. This is awesome, but I really wish other people were here too. You yeah. Know? I mean, I'm not someone that wants to live to like 150. I think, I mean, if you want to do that, that's cool. But like, I just want to like live healthy. I want to have a good, healthy life right mm-hmm. now. Like maybe live to a hundred. That'd be cool, I guess. And like, I want to be like walking, talking, like living a good life till the day I go out. It would be my ideal world. And like playing basketball till I'm old as hell and maybe snowboarding, all that stuff. Till my the dad die. Uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Playing and uh, doing jujitsu till we're have walkers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even with a walker. Yeah. Leave no. at the end of the mat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, a very interesting thing. I mean, and it's not something like it's not an all or nothing approach. It's just about maximizing the energy flow, right? And sometimes and I think there's a lot of things that like aren't quantifiable, at least yet. Um, I think you see like there's this unaccounted for factor in a lot of like health and a lot of like these longevity studies, which is just spirituality, right? Like, and I'm not saying you have to be religious. I'm not really religious, but just believing in something, I think like a higher power, even if it's yourself and believing in, I don't know, maybe serenity, peace, like that, just believing that you should need to help other people. And that that's a good outcome in life seems to have a dramatic impact on, on the quality of life, but also the length of life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Believing in something beyond yourself is definitely um, very important in terms of longevity and quality of life. Um, I would also say like one good example of this is Jake, like Jake Miner. Um, You know, he went from a very poor state of health to a very thermostate of health. Um, And then like 
once he entered that thermostate of health, he was like, man, I have to get as many people here as possible. Like he's a true evangelist of the bioenergetic theory. Um, he's always talking to people on calls. He's always talking to the people around him about thermo. Um, like he, he's definitely a great example of being able to reach a state of abundance and then trying to get as many other people there as possible. Yes, sir. The thermo warrior himself. Yes, definitely. Um, but, but yeah, I, go ahead. No, yes, yeah, so, yeah. I think that's. I mean, I think that's what it's all about. We're trying to he- here for just trying to, and it's not necessarily get like I said. It gets people A to Z. It's just like getting them next step there. And then when you see that light, when you see that like slight increase in energy, like oh, all right, this is cool. Let me see what else I can do. Let me correct those micronutrient deficiencies, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And um, one thing to note here is that without stress, like there is really no energy flow through the system. Like um, stress or some type of stimulus is necessary in order for any life to exist. Like you, there always has to be opposing, like there always has to be opposing forces in order for um, like life to be able to exist, period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the fundamental qualities of all living beings is mm-hmm. the ability to adapt to stimulus. It's like yin and yang, like there's no light without darkness, no darkness that light all of that stuff but literally i mean the only time i was uh writing a post about this recently last night like the only time that living is living <laughs> being a living being and being able to adapt to stimulus is pretty much synonymous mm-hmm. right in any cell whether it's light you see trees grow towards the sun right they and it's not like trees just grow up they're not genetically programmed you see grandmas can go to the gym and lift and gain muscle um, you can see, you can learn a new language at any age, new skill. You see bit, um, postural changes in people too. Like you see someone that does powerlifting, they get more and more compressed. They start walking around like a penguin, the best powerlifters. Then you see other people like yogis. Um, and obviously like you're most plastic when you're younger, but it doesn't mean you can't make significant changes. It just might happen slower or it might be a little more difficult. But like you see yoga people that get absurdly flexible. Um, so having the ability and the energy to do that i think is something that we overlooked a lot Mm -hmm. but it's just so fundamental to living beings and it's like i always give this analogy it's like you want to build a wall you have a lot it's going to be a lot easier when you have a lot of resources and money to do so right Mm -hmm. so you just pile that energy on um make it as as clean as a process as possible like digestion is like you want to have the the clean ingredients that don't take a lot of waste that don't aren't don't take two years to dry you want to have the process just continually cycling. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, yeah, you got anything else? Um, I think that's about it. All righty. Awesome. Well, thanks for listening to the 100th episode of the Thermo Diet Podcast. Um, make sure to share this with anyone that uh, you think might need it or might like it, and we'll talk to you next time. Have a good one. Peace. Peace.